There's a whole series of anniversaries the poor chap is going to go through. At the moment, he's in the middle of his 10th anniversary of being tortured in Wagner. And one of the things we as British people need to be thinking about is why is there not yet a criminal inquiry into British complicity, far more overt than any other case that I know of, in his torture in Wagner. And once we've investigated that, let's investigate in a criminal inquiry the British involvement in his torture in Kandahar which again is as overt as anyone you know. And once we finish with that, let's talk about the British intelligence officers who went to Guantanamo Bay and were complicit in interrogating him there at the time that he was being abused by the United States. And what does it mean for the special relationship between Britain and America that after 10 years, someone who's pleaded for release and someone who has never been charged with any offense, and no one contends at this point is guilty of any offense, that he's still um, under lock and key in Guantanamo Bay. And I'll tell you one thing. If it was my little white son, he wouldn't be there, right? You know that as well as I do. I know the British get terribly uncomfortable when we talk about race, but there is nothing clearer to me than the fact that if it was a little white boy there, he wouldn't be there any longer. He'd have been out years and years and years ago. And we need to think about what that says about relationships in Britain between uh, the majority, as we sometimes refer to ourselves, and, and the Muslim community. But let's talk about the reality, too, about Shackling. He is not being held in conditions that are any better. And I defy anyone to stand up and say that he is. I've seen him recently. I saw him in November. And people from our office will be back to see him very soon. And Shaka is not being held in conditions that are any better than they've had for the last 10 years. Indeed, he's in Camp 5 Echo, which is a special disciplinary block where he's being held in solitary confinement in conditions that, that he wouldn't voice upon an animal in the Haiti. Uh, and this is being done to him. He's being disciplined for what? Not for committing a crime, but because he stands up for justice. And Shaka, I will say, is very eloquent. I wish he could come and speak to you himself. One of the reasons he hasn't been brought back to Britain is the very fact that the United States wanted to send him to Saudi Arabia, where he could be helpfully gagged so he could not talk about what's happened to him. But, um, but if Shaka was able to speak to you, uh, he would tell you that he's in this little cell by himself because he's spoken up for justice, not because he's done any criminal act, not because he's done anything wrong. And that is profoundly wrong. You know, one thing I have here is a note that he gave us that we finally got declassified, which goes through what he lists as 18 separate physical complaints he has, some of which are really dark. You know, his prostate problems, his arthritis, uh, all sorts of other things, his kidney issues, and some of which I, I saw, you know, when I took his hand and I looked at his, at his fingers, his hands were crumbling, his, his nails were orange and they were falling off him. And if you put your finger onto them, you'd, they'd crumble away. And, and this is what the United States military says is fine medical treatment. I heard just yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, some person saying that Shaka and other people in Guantanamo Bay are treated with as good medical care as this doctor's family. Well, if that's true, that doctor should be struck off because whatever he's doing to his family not only violates the Hippocratic Oath, but it also uh, is patently an illustration of why the United States needs a national health service. <laughs> now, you know, th there's a real reason also why Shaka remains in Guantanamo Bay, with, along with a lot of desperate people who we get to meet who have been cleared for release and who should long since been released. And that is that when, when Obama, and I voted for him, and I think he meant it well, when he said he was going to Guantan close Guantanamo Bay, he was very naive, and he allowed the Republicans to make this in a, into a political football. And while I think it's true that if you look around the world, we have won the moral debate on Guantanamo Bay worldwide, that the vast majority of people recognize that it's not only wrong, but it's counterproductive. Uh, but we haven't won that battle in America. And when you listen to the current crop of Republican candidates talking about what they did, there's nobody except for Ron Paul who went elected who says we should close Guantanamo Bay. And there's a number of these people who honestly say that we should keep on waterboarding people. Waterboarding people. And they don't think that's torture. Well, I'm here to let you know 
that while they call it enhanced interrogation techniques, the Spanish Inquisition called it tortura del agua, as in, as in water torture. And it was actually only the Gestapo who called it uh, enhanced, enhanced interrogation techniques, just a footnote for history. But what the Republicans and the spineless members of the Democratic Party have done is that they've now enacted a law that says that before people can be released from Guantanamo Bay, there has to be a certification by Leon Panetta himself, the Secretary of Defense, saying first that these people will never commit another crime in the future. Well, of course, they haven't committed a crime in the past. But the Secretary of Defense has to say that. And then second, he has to certify that the country they're going to, in this case Britain, will share with the United States all information they have about the associates of Chaparama. Well, I'm proud to say I'm an associate of Chaparama. So I take it that the British government has to tell the United States that whatever they're doing to bug my telephone, they're going to share with the American government when Shaka comes back in. What sort of society are we living in when that's the law in the United States? And I speak as an American when I say, because I'm American and British, so I get to apologize for a lot of things. I speak as an American when I say that that is profoundly wrong and profoundly un-American. Well, you know, when Mosin worried when I first went to see him about the death penalty, he was actually quite right. One of the things that's going to happen this year is that the United States government is going to seek to execute people in Guantanamo Bay. They plan to go forward with a series of capital trials and military commissions to seek to kill people. So this isn't even just about holding people for 10 years without trial. It's about giving them what was referred to by one of our judges as a kangaroo court to then go forward and execute people. We cannot allow this to pass out of our minds. We have to remember what that uh, says in Arabic. I'll leave it for these guys to say. I'll just say never forget. Not just never forget, but we've got to do something about it. And I blame myself that I haven't done enough. And we're going to be doing some more. I'm going to be doing more this year than I have in the past. But we need your help. We need the help of all right-thinking people here and around the world to help us close this place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Reprieve, Clive, um, Corey, and, and all the, the, the legal teams who have helped to show us um, that there is some good in the world in relation to uh, the Guantanamo prisons. I would also like to thank the members of the legal team for the support and the support of the Guantanamo prisons. They have played a great role in the government and the government of the United States. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, um, my friends in uh, the media and the press for uh, being a vehicle to put a great deal of pressure on the United States of America for what it has done, what it has done to us. Uh, I'd also uh, like to ask them once more, again, to renew their efforts, just like they did in the beginning at this 10 year anniversary, to put pressure onto the United States to uncover uh, the reality of what's happening with Guantanamo. Guantanamo is not a problem of 800 people who have been involved in the world, but it's not a problem of the world as a whole. Guantanamo isn't just a problem of about approximately 800 prisoners uh, that are being held uh, in communicado detention. Rather, it's a problem that affects the whole world if we look at it uh, holistically. Guantanamo here is not carried out of the law. Guantanamo is something that is outside the rule of law. We look at them, and it's, it, it is against um, all, uh, all all parameters of, of what is right. But I told you in Guantanamo. After I was released from Guantanamo, so after I was accepted from the Canadian Embassy in Guantanamo, I was able to visit uh, about 80 percent of those released from Guantanamo around the world. So I can say that after 10 years, I was able to visit Guantanamo, and I'm able to say that after 10 years of experience in Guantanamo, ما زالت هناك معاناة كبيرة. There is a, a great deal of difficulties and problems faced by those who were 
فورمالي كويسز ان كوانتانمو الكثير منهم يعانون من مشاكل نفسيه many of them are suffering from uh, all manner of psychological and internal problems واغلبهم عاطل عن العمل most of them uh, are not able to establish themselves in, in work and employment والكثير منهم تم اعادتهم الى السجون مره اخرى and some of them have actually been returned to prison um, in their own lands where they face oppression ليس لانه مجرمين not because they're prison because they are criminals ولكن غياب الحريات في منطقه الشرق الاوسط but because of the absence of freedom in the middle east يكفي ان يعلم الاعلام ان هناك 60000 معتقل في المملكه العربيه السعوديه بدون محاكمه just in relation to saudi arabia there are over 60000 prisoners held there without charge or trial or access to the courts. That's why uh, more than 70% of the Guantanamo prisoners um, who were revert, returned to Saudi Arabia have all been, uh, are, are in prison at present. Uh, three weeks ago I was in Baghdad قابلت اللجنه اللجنه الدوليه للصليب الاحمر. I I met the International Committee for the Red Cross. وعرفت ان العراقيين كانوا في غوانتانامو يعانون من مشاكل نفسيه. And I met uh, and I learned that the uh, Iraqi, former Iraqi Guantanamo prisoners who returned to Iraq are in a state of terrible um, psychological and mental problems. والحكومه العراقيه التي بنيتها السنويه 100 مليار دولار هي عاجزه عن تقديم مساعدة لهؤلاء. Despite the fact that the new Iraqi government is in receipt of tens of millions of dollars, they are still unable to provide any support system for these men. وكذلك الحال لكثير من الاخوه في الدول الاخرى. And this is the similar state of many of the prisoners all around in different countries. وما زال هناك 171 اسره تنتظر عودة أبنائها من غوانتانامو. And there are still 171 families who are waiting for their sons to be returned from Guantanamo. نحن لم نفقد الأمل في عودتهم. We نحن لم نفقد الأمل. We will not give up our hope in having them returned. إذا كان عام 2011 عام الحريات في الشرق الأوسط. If 2011 was the year of freedom. Uh, in the Middle East. سيكون عام 2012 عام حريات ايضا لاخواننا الذين تركناهم في غوانتانامو. Then our hope is that 2012 will be the year of freedom for uh, those who remain uh, in Guantanamo. لذلك بمعاونة الاعلام الحر. Uh, this is uh, we hope with the help from uh, the media and from free people. والقانونيين <coughs> المخلصين. And from those who are sincerely trying to establish uh, uh, fighting for their cases in the legal process. Thank you, Thank you, Okay, um, so for Alan is from the uh, design company Spritz. They've actually uh, programmed the website and also uh, all the functionality related to as well as the design course. Um, at this point, I just want to recognize two individuals in this group. One is uh, Shereen Fernandez and Sam Duran, who have been uh, Cage Prisoners researchers. They've actually put together the entire content of the website and done an amazing job in a very short space of time pulling all this vast amount of information about Guantanamo together. And it is a, a vast amount of information. It's actually amazing when you see in front of you 10 years of policies and practices that have led to Guantanamo as it is today. So Seiko's gonna um, just quickly, in a very short presentation about the Villa Panza project, uh, hopefully very soon, very, very soon. Can we uh, take another question while you guys? Okay, right, we'll take another question in the meantime, yes, please. Um, like Stanley, um, I'm sort of his his his, um, his mirror in, in, in Europe. Um, most of the Guantanamo prisoners, of course, are from the Arab world, and that's an important point to remember. So we are not necessarily representative of, of them all. 
Uh, but nonetheless, those who are in the UK, we are regularly in touch. We do meet um, regularly, we talk regularly. And it's difficult to explain this, but people aren't marking this with anything in particular. There's nothing greatly to do other than recognize that it's been 10 years of eroding your own personal um, ability to, to interact with society. It, 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 I won't say any of the former Guantanamo prisoners are broken, but I know every single one of them suffers when he sleeps at night. You can't, you can't but uh, do that when you've gone through a process like that. And it has undoubtedly uh, changed people's lives forever, destroyed some lives, and made it to a point where um, you can't escape that reality. And in a sense, this 10-year anniversary only heightens that, that it's just another reminder of the most painful part of your life. So, despite that, we'll probably all be sitting down to dinner um, to talk about issues after some of our events that are taking place, but not because it's a 10-year anniversary. It's just uh, one of the things we do have amongst us is a certain camaraderie that has been developed over these years. Most of uh, the European countries uh, were very vocal in condemning Guantanamo, but uh, do you think they've been less enthusiastic in uh, taking some of these former things into their countries? And if you think so, how do you explain this? Uh, when you say less enthusiastic, I think they've been thoroughly unenthusiastic, and France has led the lead on that. Um, it's, it's been a huge problem. There's been a lot of talk, but very little action. And we've had a project where we've been trying to resettle a lot of people who can't go back to countries where they'll be abused simply because the, the, they weren't in that country and they've fled it to avoid persecution. Uh, and the Europeans have been pathetic, frankly, about doing anything about it. And how can we? expect to help Obama do what he wants to do and close Guantanamo if we're not willing to take the most minimal step. And let's face it, on the other side, there was a time when it would have been clear that Britain wouldn't have been attacked by any extremist group because Britain was viewed as a country that was fair to asylum seekers and that wasn't picking on people because they were Muslim. Um, that's not true anymore, and that's because we've, under Blair particularly, given up that role of fairness around the world, and we've decided to pick on people like Moses Bear, who's being a, a wicked, evil terrorist. And that's just profoundly wrong. It's not just wrong, but it's stupid. If you want to avoid yourself from being a target for lunatic people who want to use bombs to blow folk up, then the first thing you do is you behave decently so that there are more people out there who wish you well, and more people out there who want to help you prevent yourself from becoming a target. If you want to become a target for the lunatic fringe, then you behave badly and then they all get upset and decide that you're the bad guy and that you should be the one for the next attack. So what we're doing is just wrong, but it's also very unwise. It may pander well to certain um, newspapers, but it doesn't pander well to common sense. Last year, I, I went with um, Reprieve to do a, a tour of, of uh, European countries asking for people to be resettled and if they were taking Guantanamo prisons and uh, some of those countries did eventually agree to take people but the biggest the biggest problem that we found when talking to the foreign ministers of the country was that well this is an American problem if America's not taking them why should we and it seems to be odd because if you put to them that there are many American problems uh, that you have taken refugees from you've taken the Iraqi refugees and Afghani refugees and that's not a problem, but it's because of the language. You didn't change the language of these things. You kept on saying, or the United States kept on saying, that there's still terrorism suspect, there are still fears about them, and we still want to have some sort of surveillance and some sort of um, uh, reassurance that they won't re-offend as if they'd offended to begin with. And so nobody was changing the language. And I said, the reality is that these people have been tortured, they've been abused, they've been held in false imprisonment, Without a trial, uh, had it been investigated by the world's most powerful intelligence and law enforcement agencies, <coughs> isn't it about time that the language is changed? 
that they're not called terrorism suspects anymore. Um, and once that's done, then, then the resettlement process will be so much easier. Can I just say something on that point? You know, it strikes me as fascinating for all of you in, who are interested in the Levison inquiry right now that we get desperately upset when some celebrity gets slandered for something they probably didn't do. This is some rich person who can go out and hire a lawyer and come in and sue everybody and straighten everything up. But we don't get upset when someone like Mosin Beck, who is no more a terrorist than, than my three-year-old, uh, when everyone goes around saying he's a terrorist. And I, I think this is something we need to think about pretty seriously, which is whether we got our priorities right when we're concerned only about celebrities and we're not concerned about the people who are being harmed vastly more by the defamation, and that's the only word for it, that's being put out about their name. I want to take some more questions, but if we just pause for a moment, because we're finally set up, and I'll hand it over to Sapol. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just take a few minutes just for a Authorization act. And what this necessarily means, because it seems the Green Paper and that have a parallel, in that they're trying to establish some sort of being flimsy legal boundaries. What, what are the actual legal legal substantiation of that, and, and what, what could it mean? And, and, uh, uh, and I was actually off, well, I've, I've got some other questions. Let's look at this one. Right. Well, the NDAA was what I was mentioning before that set parameters about what uh, Obama can and can't do, supposedly, <coughs> uh, in terms of releasing prisoners. And there are several criteria, I believe there are five criteria that the Secretary of Defense has to, has to designate. So, for example, someone coming back to Britain, I mentioned the two that he has to, that the Panetta has to say they won't commit a crime in the future and that Britain will share information. Panetta also has to certify that Britain is not a terrorist state, and Britain might be done, that Britain is not about to topple under a revolution, and so forth. All of these things are actually quite difficult in getting prisoners out of Guantanamo Bay, because if you think about it, uh, Tunisia, for example, had, which has a number of prisoners in Guantanamo who didn't want to go back to Tunisia beforehand because they were going to be tortured, now they don't mind going back because thanks to the Arab Spring, Tunisia has a new government which uh, should be much more enlightened and sensible. Unfortunately, from the U.S. perspective, Tunisia's new democracy hasn't proven itself. They prefer to deal with the old uh, regime, which would go around abusing people. And so, therefore, right now, one of the things you probably couldn't meet to send someone back to Tunisia is you couldn't get the imprimatur of the US government on the new government of Tunisia. All of these paradoxes are just piled on top of each other. Uh, there's also an effort in the NDAA, NDAA to prevent uh, the Obama administration from spending any money on trying prisoners in any way other than through the military commissions. So they're trying to put pay to the Obama administration's preference to use real courts to try to do, uh, which again is another way to, for America to lose credibility worldwide. But if that's what the Republicans and the pusillanimous uh, Democrats want to do. Uh, and Obama has said in his signing statement, he signed the NDAA, but he did say in his signing statement that he didn't think some of these things were legal. Uh, whether, on the other hand, uh, in the run up to an election, he's got the courage to do the right thing. In Guantanamo or in Bagram, which by the way has a lot more prisoners in it than Guantanamo has, you know, whether he's going to do the right thing there, I don't know. I've 